uh, Emmanuel and I are going to split this hour into two, uh, two half hours. Uh, I'm going to speak about three uh, projects that uh, we've been uh, uh, starting uh, with the SMILE group uh, starting in early April. Um, and so the, um, these three projects are, are I, will, I will talk about the first two. Uh, we can say that there's, there's an increasing uh, degree of complexity going from the th first to the third one. The first project is about uh, predicting the effect of contact tracing. The second one is about uh, investigating uh, the parameters of uh, the microepidemics that take place within households. Uh, it's called uh, the ALCOV2 project. And the third uh, project is about uh, linking a very general class of individual-based epidemic models with the uh, mechanic from first PDE and uh, how, how it simplifies uh, much of these, uh, of these models. And that's Emmanuel's part. So the uh, SMILE uh, group, uh, both Emmanuel and I are, are part of, uh, is an in interdisciplinary group that uh, was started in, uh, in 2012. Uh, SMILE stands for Stochastic Models for the Inference of Life Evolution. And uh, some of us have uh, been taking part uh, in various parts of these three projects. Uh, and in the third project, I would uh, like to emphasize the, the role of, of Felix Futelrozzi, uh, who is a PhD student co-supervised by, by Emmanuel and myself. So the, the, the first model is called the, toy, the first project, the toy model to predict the effect of contact tracing. Um, so the idea is to try to um, um, guess how many uh, app users we need to curb the epidemic. You, you all know that a uh, um, specific characteristic of SARS-CoV-2 is that there is a very long period of infectiousness without symptoms, whether that be uh, due to uh, infectious presymptomatics or, or individuals who are totally as asymptomatic but still infectious. And that, that's, that's actually a, uh, an important difference with the SARS-CoV-1, which has been, uh, 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 been uh, under control more, more easily because of the lack of these uh, periods of infectiousness without symptoms. And so, and so contact tracing by a mobile application, the idea is to uh, improve isolation of uh, pre-symptomatics, asymptomatics, and, and even symptomatics. Um, and for, for pre and asymptomatics, we call it quarantine. Uh, for symptomatics, we call that uh, case isolation. Um, to um, reduce the number of transmissions uh, that take place before symptoms. So the question that uh, I would like to ask is uh, if, if we can design uh, the most explicit and simple criterion on the fraction Y of app users that we need to curb the epidemic, okay? Uh, and so I, I will make two, uh, two assumptions. One is that each time an app user receives an alert, she is independently removed from the epidemic with a given probability that I call probability of cooperation, okay? And each time she receives an alert, she is removed with the same probability, okay? So for, uh, uh, so, so, so to not be removed, you have to defect to all these alerts uh, the, the independently, okay, at each time. And uh, we assume that each time you remove one individual from uh, the epidemic, you remove its whole, its entire potential descendants in the, in the transmission tree, okay? So it's called subtree pruning. Assuming that you're, if you're isolated, it means that you want to prevent further infections. So the, the model is very simple. At least for now, it's just a two-type uh, Galton-Watson process. So we assume, as in Tom's talk, that susceptibles are always in excess. And uh, we are given two types, asymptomatics and symptomatics. So A for asymptomatics and I for symptomatics. Uh, we have to consider uh, a very important uh, char uh, characteristic of the, uh, of the uh, disease, which is the frequency of asymptomatics in the population. And we will uh, distinguish between the uh, mean number of secondary infections uh, when they uh, come from asymptomatics or from symptomatics, okay? And so the R0 that uh, Tom has talked about uh, extensively is the, is the average of these two quantities, and so it's F R sub A plus one minus F R sub I. Um, and so here you see on the, on the right panel, you see that I will take always, I will always consider this convention that, uh, um, uh, sorry, blacks, black disks are are symptomatics and the white discs are asymptomatics. And you see that on this, on this picture that uh, yeah, there are more uh, transmissions com coming from symptomatic that, rather than from asymptomatics. Uh, I, will, uh, I will make some 
uh, applications, numeric application, and so I have to uh, tell you what default values I will take for, for these parameters. Uh, I will take for the frequency of asymptomatics one third, which is uh, between the two, uh, let's say, most frequent estimations that are 20% for um, so the, the first two uh, citations here, uh, which are, if I remember well, um, in the Guangzhou province um, and in the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship. And the 40% is another estimate from uh, Japanese uh, repatriation flights. And from, uh, I don't know if you know the story of the, uh, of the city of Vaux in Italy, where uh, they have uh, tested every single inhabitant. Uh, it's, a, it's a small city of like uh, 200 people. And they found that 40% uh, of, uh, of individuals have, have been, uh, uh, of, of, uh, sorry, of uh, infected individuals uh, were asymptomatic. I would take R sub A equal to R sub A equal to four, and so it gives you an average of R naught equals 3.3, which is exactly the, uh, the, yes, the point estimate in France. So just a, a very uh, a simple observation is that if F times R sub A is larger than one, uh, the epidemic would be out of control simply because uh, the, the transmission tree restricted to uh, transmission from A to A uh, is super critical. Now, just I, I want to first consider the, the net effect. Uh, well, I, no, I want I want to compare, you know, the uh, uh, the effect of contact tracing uh, when there is isolation without contact tracing and isolation with contact tracing. Okay, so uh, I don't want to compare the effect of contact tracing to the R naught, the natural R naught. And so I have to first uh, consider, take into account the uh, effect of non-digital isolation and quarantine. And so just to have like uh, numbers in mind, if you assume that symptomatic self-isolate upon symptom and set, it will thin transmissions from I individuals by a factor B, and this factor B uh, has to be uh, larger than 40% because the fraction of transmissions made before symptoms, as you can see on the, on the cartoon, on the right where time zero is the time of symptoms, you can see that uh, the fraction of secondary infections taking place uh, before symptoms is approximately 40%. And so, and so this B has to be uh, larger than 40%. Now, if you assume that all those symptomatics alert their private contacts who then self-quarantine, it would remove uh, an additional fraction uh, KR of transmissions from uh, I individuals. And uh, this KR now has to, be, has to be smaller than approximately 15% uh, as, as testified by the, the paper that I'm selling here. So, so the cartoon on the right uh, basically tells you what happens that um, because people are, are told to um, uh, isolate in case of symptoms and to alert their private contacts in case of symptom, um, you see that it will thin uh, transmission by a factor B and, uh, and remove uh, individuals uh, that are private contacts to high individuals uh, with a probability one minus K. And so now the, the net effective R sub i uh, is b times one minus k r r i, and we take b equals 1 point, 0 0.6, so it's approximately two. Now, you, if you assume that uh, on top of that, you have social distancing, uh, it will, uh, as, as in Tom's talk, it will uh, scale r sub a and r sub i uh, simultaneously by a factor c, and c is, uh, is unknown, it has to be, it has to be uh, estimated from data, but we assume that c can be tuned in order to uh, see what's the net effect of contact tracing compared to the effective R0 obtained after these uh, three kinds of non-digital interventions. Okay, so now, now let's, go, let's go to uh, the uh, uh, model of contact tracing. So now on top of uh, A and I individuals, you will add two new types. Uh, y, those who carry the app, and N, those who don't carry the app, okay? You assume that small y is the fraction of app users. And as uh, Tom uh, outlined, um, sorry, underlined, uh, you need at least y uh, larger than one minus one over R naught, otherwise uh, the transmission of the, of the epidemic just through uh, non-app users uh, would be super critical. Uh, now you assume that Q naught and Q1 are the cooperating uh, probability that I mentioned in the introduction. What do I mean by that? I mean that upon symptom onset, an individual who is YI, so in the cartoon on the right, 
it's a square which is filled. Okay, a black square is an individual who is a square, so it's he or he or she is carrying the app, and a black means that uh, she is symptomatic. Okay, so upon symptom onset, this this person uh, informs the app with probability Q naught, right, the cooperating probability. And then the app automatically uh, alerts uh, the direct physical contacts of YI. But bear in mind that the direct physical contacts of uh, an individual uh, are form a, uh, a, sub, a sub network uh, of, the, of the transmission tree. Okay, so, sorry, the contrary. The transmission tree is a sub network of the, of the contact network. And so, in the context of degree one, the direct physical contacts of this black square. You have all the daughters in the transmission tree, but also the mother. Okay, and so when Y, uh, which means any contact of degree one who is a square, who is a NAP user, uh, receives the alert, it, he, she uh, self quarantines with priority Q1, and we will assume that the daughters uh, are removed, but the mother is not, because we assume that it's too late. Right? So she can be removed, but the, the, the transmission, the infection that she, she's responsible of. Uh, still uh, can still uh, be running. Okay, so, so you, you see here on the on, on the right basically what happens. Uh, the uh, black square uh, informs or her app informs uh, the, the other square in her uh, contact network, and some of them are removed with probability Q1. Now, as, as as Tom said, you, you just have to consider the mean of three matrix of these two type Y versus N Galton Watson process, and now the epidemic dies out if the leading eigenvalue of M is more than one. Okay. And so here, uh, what's nice is that actually the, the, the characteristic polynomial of M is just a, a two degree polynomial. And the, and the leading eigenvalue of M is more than one if and only if Q evaluated at one is positive, okay? And this leads to a, a very simple uh, two, uh, two degree, uh, second degree uh, uh, inequality, uh, which is given here. And actually we are not surprised to see that uh, we have a y squared uh, occurring in this uh, equation because, um, because for an alert to uh, be efficient, you need to have two app users, the, the, the mother and the daughter of the transmission. And so the minimum fraction of app carriers is just a solution to this, uh, to this uh, equation. And if you plot this, here's what you'll find. So on the, on the x-axis, you have R0, the effective R0, as I, as I try to emphasize, um, which is obtained in the absence of contact tracing, but in the presence of other non-digital in interventions. And on the y-axis, you see the minimal rate of app users to curb the epidemic. And you see that this rate steeply rises just after R0 uh, takes off from one. Okay? And this means that even if R0, your effective R0 is of the order of, let's say, 1.5, you need at least of the order of 0.7, 70% app users to curb, the, to curb the epidemic, and that's for cooperation probabilities that are equal to one, okay? Uh, which means that all app users uh, cooperate with the, uh, with the app. So when I saw that, I was really freaking out because that was at a time where we could see like reinfections uh, in Korea and, and in China. And so I was really like wondering whether there was, there was another uh, solution uh, uh, than um, uh, these, these uh, apps. Uh, and then I said, okay, that's for degree one, okay? That's contact tracing only for degree one physical contacts. But what if you now alert the contacts of your contacts? That's, the, that's what is called recursive tracing, okay? So now assume that the app alerts physical contacts of physical contacts of the index case. The index case on the cartoon here on the right panel is the black square, okay? So the black square um, uh, sees, sees the, some symptoms and then as previously, alerts the app, informs the app with priority Q0, that's the red arrows. And now, all the degrees of, uh, all the uh, contacts of contacts uh, are automatically uh, alerted by the contacts of degree one, okay? And then, then self-quarantine with priority Q2, right? You can assume that this priority of cooperation is different from uh, second degree uh, contacts. Uh, and then we assume that Y is removed if granddaughter of YI uh, is removed with priority one half if uh, the Y is a, is a sibling of the, of the index case. And now we're left with, with six states. Okay. 
you can be app user or not, you can be uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic, and you can be uh, conveying an alert from degree one contact to degree two contact. But now, I, I, as I said in the beginning, I really wanted to have a, a, an explicit and simple criterion for, on, on why for the epidemic to be curved. And, uh, and so I didn't want to uh, just uh, compute the uh, leading eigenvalue of a six by six matrix. And so um, I, I, what I propose is, is a little more subtle uh, solution, which is uh, called the stopping line. Okay, so here, what I represented on this cartoon is a transmission tree pruned for removals due to uh, quarantines and isolations. You see that again, you have the black squares, uh, which are people who are app users and symptomatic. Uh, in white, you have uh, up, uh, the, black, the white squares are app users uh, who are not symptomatic. And in gray, you have all the individuals who are not alerted by an ancestor or a sibling. Okay. And so actually, these gray uh, uh, squares and uh, circles are regenerative states for the epidemic. And so what happens is that if you look at this transmission tree, which is drawn so as to stop at, at the first uh, gray individual on each line, you see that the set of gray individuals is called the stopping line, and the epidemic is super critical if and only if the galton watson process that counts the number of gray individuals descending from the gray ancestor is super critical itself. Okay? And so if you do that, you can compute uh, the mean of spring matrix of this two-type gotten watson process. It's not really, really interesting in its own right. But you know that, again, the epidemic dies out if and only if it's leading like eigenvalue smaller than one. Okay? And, you, and you get, I think, the simplest formula that you can get, which is a, 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 three, a third degree polynomial. And we are not surprised, again, because for alerts of degree two to uh, be efficient, you need triples of uh, app users. And so that's why you see uh, uh, a third degree polynomial here. I just have to um, specify that here you have a new parameter, uh, x sub a or t sub a, uh, which is uh, the probability that an individual of type y, daughter of an individual of type yz, where z can be a or i, defects to all the alerts coming from her siblings of type y i. OK, so if you remember, means that when you are yourself a NAP user, your mother is also a NAP user, and one of your siblings is a NAP user who is symptomatic, then you will receive an alert of degree two. And so TZ is the probability that you defect to all these alerts coming from all your siblings, okay? And so if the offspring numbers are Poisson, so here I have always reasoned uh, on average, but if the offspring numbers are possible, you have to uh, make some assumption on the uh, probability distribution of offspring numbers. If they are Poisson, you can compute explicitly these numbers. And so now I, so, so now I was very curious to know whether uh, recursive tracing could rescue us. And so if what you see here is the, the, the graph that I, I showed uh, previously. And now we show the same graph, but in the case of recursive tracing. So, sorry, that's again forward tracing, so one step forward or backward. Uh, and, uh, and, and so you, he, you see here that Q1 is not one, and so you have to have more app users to curb the epidemic because the cooperation probability is not one, it's 0.6. And if you compare to recursive tracing, you see that the difference is very small. And it is only actually, it's, it, has only, um, it has only an effect for R nodes, which are like close to two, okay? So the, the, the conclusion is that you see there's no, there's no effect of recursive tracing, at least uh, with these, uh, with these uh, values. And so I was, I was quite uh, worried when I saw that, but uh, I think that's, that's what happens. Uh, my conclusion that recursive tracing can rarely rescue forward tracing. And, and, and in fact, when it does, it does at a potentially high economic and psychological cost because when you quarantine, quarantine the uh, uh, contacts uh, of, a, of, a, of a symptomatic individual, you not only quarantine uh, it's her daughters, you also quarantine all her contacts.
like uh, all her physical contacts. So, so that, may, that might be, especially when you have a degree two contacts, that might be a large number. Uh, so the minimum app adoption rate, uh, why not to curb the epidemic rises very steeply as a function of the effective R0. Uh, so that current moderate rates of adoption of these uh, contact tracing apps are unable to curb an epidemic by themselves. Uh, that's actually a robust result in, in a wide range of scenarios uh, for when you change the parameters. So the, this, uh, this, uh, this work is, uh, is available uh, as a preprint and, and made archive. And you, call, you can also uh, consult these, these three other uh, papers, recent papers on the, on, the, on the same topic, but more on the simulation side than on the mathematical side. My, my second uh, project, uh, the second project that I wanted to, uh, to talk about uh, very briefly is called ALCOV2. Uh, ALCOV2 is a, is a large scale project with uh, uh, some members of the SMILE group, but especially Grégory Nuel uh, uh, and, uh, and some other uh, units and data science uh, uh, laboratories and, uh, and firms. Uh, and the idea of this project is that the lockdown can be seen as a life-size experiment of a microepidemic that takes place inside the household, okay? And the, the idea is to, is to try to take advantage of this. So what we did, so, so our goal, yes, is to estimate parameters of these microepidemics, <clears throat> daily infection rate, fraction of asymptomatics, decrease of infectiousity with time, and maybe uh, let these, uh, all these parameters depend on who, uh, who transmits and who receives the disease. So what we've done is uh, to, uh, to uh, start to publish sorry, a, a questionnaire uh, online during the whole uh, month of May uh, 2020. It's still actually uh, possible to, to fill it. Um, and we replicated in parallel this, uh, this questionnaire on a representative panel of uh, 10,000 French households, thanks to uh, uh, the cooperation of uh, two survey institutes. And we only kept the answers from households with at least two members where at least one displays uh, COVID-related symptoms in order to uh, uh, consider only epidemics that took place inside the household. Okay? The questions uh, that we asked are about risk factors, list of symptoms, medical interventions or testing, if any, and also about the household uh, composition, the number and age of people in the household, uh, its size, and especially the dates of appearance of first symptoms. Here's a, a snapshot of the questionnaire. Uh, une enquête pour étudier la présence de symptômes possiblement liés à COVID-19 et l'historique de leur transmission dans les foyers français pendant la période de confinement. Uh, so here you see one of the, I think the last, uh, the last page of uh, the questionnaire about symptoms. You see 16 symptoms. Uh, the results that uh, we got recently, so we, we hit uh, 6,000 uh, households, which uh, represent 20,000 individuals. 60% of these, so each household uh, has some symptoms, at least one individual. And if you pull all these individuals, 60% of them display symptoms. 14% of them uh, have a chronic disease. Uh, 1,000 of them uh, were tested, so it's very small. Uh, that's the, uh, maybe one, specific, uh, one specificity of France. And we asked also a question whether individuals believe that they have been infected, and 18% and of them uh, said so. Okay, so one of the problems that we have, so that's really a work in progress. I just want to show you now two slides, uh, and then I will uh, uh, hand the, uh, uh, the control of the of the presentation to Emmanuel. Um, so there are two, there are two sides of, the, of, of, of this problem, two aspects. One aspect is that we, we have no certainty on the COVID status of respondents. We only have symptoms, right? 16 symptoms. Um, and the idea that we had is to cluster patients in four classes. No disease, a disease but not the good one, influ influenza-like illness, ILLI, mild COVID or severe COVID, okay? And so the idea is that we want to have a map that gives you the uh, likelihood of being uh, COVID, uh, let's say, uh, what was the, what's the, what's the word? Ill, Ill, Ill because of, of COVID. And, uh, and, and, this, and this map uh, has to take as input all the, the symptoms, okay? And so of course there's a, a dependency uh, between these symptoms and uh, what we're going to, to do is use the item response theory to do that. 
So what is it? The idea is very simple. So for a single individual, yi is the random variable that tells you if some symptom i is present, zero otherwise. And we assume that there's a latent variable theta with normal prior called symptomatic complexity that drives all the uh, dependencies between the yi's. Okay? So the yi's are independent conditional on complexity theta and the class C. And here's how, how it's done. So you, if you call uh, R sub i, the odds ratio of the symptom i conditional on complexity and, and, and the class, uh, it's just a logistic regression that tells you that R i, log R i, let's say, uh, is a, the linear function of this, uh, of this latent variable, okay? So let's say just, it's, it's very simple, it's just to say that, so here you see the uh, symptomatic complexity continuum on the x-axis, okay? Uh, for each color, to each color corresponds a different symptom. So it's taken from another paper, so don't, don't, don't uh, pay attention to the, uh, to the uh, labels. Uh, and, and you see the, the, the probability, and you see that this curve uh, gives you the probability of, uh, gives you the probability of, uh, of having this, this uh, given symptom for this given color. Uh, given uh, your complexity. And so the beta i here is really the median of, uh, of each of these uh, curves, okay? And so, and so then you, you get the posterior distribution of your class conditional on yi, which so tells you if you are, let's say, uh, COVID or not, uh, as, a, as this uh, very simple formula, okay? Uh, and so my, my last slide is, that is really the, the model of microepidemic that we will use. We will use a, what is called a SEIR model uh, in household with fixed size N, with four states, susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered. And the parameters are as, as follows. We assume that the distributions of sojourn times in states E and I are prescribed by the medical literature, at least their shape. We have a probability of being asymptomatic that we want to estimate. We have infection rates that uh, come in two flavors. One is the infection rate from outside household, and the other one is the infection rate uh, between uh, household members inside, uh, be, uh, between household members. And so the transitions are as follows. You go from S to ET, where T means that the time you will stay in the exposed state is T, which is this uh, simple formula that takes in input the total number of infectives uh, this very day. With prob probability one, you decrease from ET to ET minus one. Same for IT to IT minus one. And when, you, when there's only one day left in exposed state, you, uh, you go to a class IT of probability tau sub I of T. And same for I1 to R of probability one. So now the idea is that we will use a hidden Markov model where the hidden state is quite large. It's really the SEIR status for each household member, which is hidden. The only thing that we have is the time when individuals get their first symptoms, okay? But for the small households that we get, typically two, three, four, five, we can do that. We can do that and we, and we, we, and we have a uh, first uh, result that, uh, that prove that this model is identifiable, including uh, the symptomatic uh, frequency. Uh, and so this identifiability is really uh, linked to the fact that we have temporal data. Uh, and it's uh, quite different from um, uh, two other kinds of approaches that have uh, uh, dealt with um, household uh, transmission. Uh, the first approach is an approach where you count the number of people who have been symptomatic at some point inside the, your household. Uh, and, the, and the other approach uh, consists in knowing who has been symptomatic, but no temporal data, just the information to have been symptomatic at some point, okay? And so we will uh, try to leverage on this temporal data to uh, uh, estimate all these parameters and, uh, and we'll keep you informed as soon as we get some, uh, some, some results. And, and now uh, I, I think I'm done and I can let uh, Emmanuel talk about the third project, thank you. Emmanuel, if you'd like to share your screen, uh, maybe Amari stop sharing.
et So can you, can you see my slides? Okay, so as everybody has noticed, Emmanuel Scherzer is now taking over. Please, you have the floor. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. So uh, I will talk um, about another project uh, that we started uh, around two months ago. Um, so I should warn you that from a mathematical point of view, I'm afraid there is nothing extremely new. I think. Uh, what we are trying to do here um, is to kind of recast uh, some of the known results uh, in the probability literature to kind of give like a, a kind of general framework to, uh, to tackle uh, the, the, the current epidemics. So, so what we want to do is to propose a framework which is uh, tractable uh, from an analytical point of view and to do some inference and which is also extremely well motivated uh, from uh, microscopic epidemic models, okay, so from individual based model. Um, so, um, so here is an outline of my talk. So first of all, I will talk about a very, very general, uh, it's not like a model, it's more like a class of stochastic epidemic individual based models, stochastic ones, with an arbitrary number of compartments. Uh, so you could have hospitalized uh, uh, people ending uh, in intensive care units, anything you like, you could have different age classes, uh, any type of heterogeneity you can think of. So this is actually quite general. And uh, what we would like to show here is that, uh, of course, like at the microscopic levels, these models are kind of difficult to handle, but when you look at them uh, at, in a large population limit, actually what you get at the end of the day is something which is actually rather uh, tractable. And uh, what we show is that everything boils down to a very simple PDE, which is the McEnrick von Furster PDE. Right? And what this PD is, is doing for you is, well, it's just describing the age structure of the population. And by age, I mean the age of infection for how many days you have been sick. And once you can solve these PDEs and you can recover like all the observables that we can have in the very detailed uh, data uh, available to us. So uh, I will then try to show you um, how we can use uh, this very simple modeling framework to do some um, robust uh, inference on uh, the r naught before, during, and after the lockdown. And uh, this is uh, very, I mean, this will be actually quite similar to what um, was done during the first talk. And then if I have uh, some time at the end, I will tell you a little bit um, about like spatial models, okay? So, um, so as you may know, so, so one of the main issue with uh, the COVID-19 epidemics is that there is a, a rather complicated uh, life cycle of the virus. So uh, when the age of infection is, is zero, so, so when you get infected, then at the beginning you are exposed, meaning that uh, you're uh, infected but not infectious. And then starting from here, then there are different paths, right? So if you look at the lower branch of the tree, the lower branch as well, uh, you have very mild symptoms and uh, well, fortunately you will be uh, out of the disease like in a few days, but um, if you take the upper branch, uh, then well, you can experience uh, se severe symptoms and sometimes you end up at the hospital or like in the intensive care units. And uh, well, I mean, there are many different scenarios, right? So, so, so here um, there are some of those classes in this diagram that you can observe, like let's say the number of deaths hospitalized and those are like kind of robust estimations, but other, well, like um, estimating uh, the frequency of asymptomatic, let's say, uh, on uh, well, the fraction of individuals having mild symptoms who do not go to the doctor is much more difficult to, 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 to kind of um, handle, right? So, um, okay, so, so what I would like to do now is to really start from a, a very general class of, um, of, uh, of, of, of individual based model, okay? And so here, um, the idea is to, not have an SIR model, but to generalize the approach a little bit, what I would like to have is a susceptible infected dynamics, okay? And all my individuals would be decorated with a life history process, okay? So, so let me uh, give you a, a bit more details about this. So, so at any time t, I will always distinguish between two types of, the, uh, of individuals. So there is a binary distinction between susceptible, okay? And by susceptible, I mean the usual thing, right? You have not been infected before, 
or infected. And by infected, and this is quite important, I mean something a bit broader than usual, right? So infected doesn't mean that you're infectious. Infectious, it means that you have been infected before, right? So for, ex for instance, if you're recovered or like that, you're uh, considered as an infected individual, okay? And so one crucial uh, 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 variable in what will follow is, uh, as I said before, the age of the infection. So the age of the infection is the time elapsed since the infection on onset. So if uh, you are dead and your age of infection is dead, it means that you have been infected uh, 10 days ago and, uh, well, uh, you died from the disease like before 10 days. So, so now what I would like to do is that on top of this binary distinction, which is very rough, right, I would like to, to give more details about the different stages which are visited by an individual. So an infected individual will be characterized by a life process. And the life process is just a stochastic process telling you uh, what is the class visited by the individual at age A, right? So for example, if you condition on the death trajectories and at the beginning at, at age zero, at the beginning of the infection, you were exposed, then uh, you will be uh, presymptomatic and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and then at the end you can die, right? So, so, so what I would like to also mention is that in general, those models are highly non-Markovian. So for instance, the, the, the waiting time between uh, two uh, classes uh, can be non-exponential and actually in general, uh, you assume, uh, you can assume for instance that they are parameterized by some gamma random variables, okay? Um, so for the moment, I just told you uh, what happens for a single indiv individual, but now what I would like to do is to kind of like prescribe uh, the way uh, the, the disease will spread in the population. And the way it is done is by enriching a little bit uh, the population. So you have a population of size n, so, so this is a finite population model. And then the infected individual will be characterized by two things. It will be characterized by this life history process, which is X, but also by an infection process. And the infection process uh, on, a, on a more formal level is just a point measure, right? Describing the age of individual X at a contact with someone else in your population, right? So, so if you have an atom on uh, your infection uh, process at age two, this means that two days after the infection, you sent a propagule uniformly at random in the population, you hit someone completely at random, and if the target individual is susceptible, then it becomes infected. But if it was infected before, then nothing happens. So, so there is some non-linearity in the system in the sense uh, that uh, you have some finite population uh, effect, right? So, okay. So before like, going any further, uh, again, I would like to emphasize that this is kind of like the most general uh, in, like infection in, uh, epidemic model you can think of. For instance, if you want to recover SIR, then uh, you take your infection measure to be a Poisson point process that you cut uh, at a certain exponential time, which corresponds to recovery. If you want to model SEIR process, so exposed, E for exposed, then, uh, well, you freeze. So at the beginning, uh, so there is a certain random variable L during which uh, nothing happens. You don't set any, any propagal in, uh, in the environment. And after that, you behave uh, exactly as in the previous model. But you could have something which is, I mean, much more complicated than this. For instance, if you assume that uh, there is some heterogeneity in your population uh, and that uh, different age classes uh, have like different infectious uh, potential, think about like, uh, for instance, uh, in the current pandemic, um, think about, yeah. If you, if, if you think about uh, children, right? I mean, they are believed to be less infectious than others. So you could imagine that different classes have different infection process associated to them. So, so, so you can, well, I mean, in principle, you can have like a lot of heterogeneity in this type of model. Another thing that I would like to mention is that uh, at least at the microscopic level, uh, there is also a very non-trivial correlation between the life history process and the infection model in the sense that, well, for instance, if you're dead, you're not infectious anymore. And if you get hospitalized, then uh, you will be isolated from the rest of the population and you're, uh, uh, infectious potential will be highly reduced, right? So, so in general, I mean, well, this, this pair of like processes, the life history and the infection process can be correlated in a, non, in a, in a very non-trivial way. So of course, like given the current uh, situation, there is a strong incentive to, to, to model uh, a lockdown. So, so the way you do that is uh, actually quite straightforward. So you start from uh, the previous model, 
But now you have what I would call a suppression function C. So actually C is one minus C in the other. So, so I, I, I apologize for this, but uh, the C of T is some, uh, so is valued in zero one. So you want to think of it as a, as a probability, right? And so if you want to go um, from the previous model to uh, a model with suppression, then what you do is that at time t, if there is a potential contact, if there is a contact in your population, then you suppress it with, uh, you ignore the contact with probability one minus c, okay? So c of t equal to zero uh, corresponds to a perfect isolation in your population. So this is a complete lockdown. C of t is equal to one. You just let uh, the virus flow completely free freely uh, in your population. A kind of like more interesting situation is uh, what you see uh, in the last item of this slide. So you can, uh, uh, you start with a single infected individual, then you give yourself a stopping time, which corresponds to the beginning of the lockdown period, for instance, so think of T of K as the time at which the number of recorded deaths exceeds a certain threshold. So in France, for instance, uh, everything was completely blocked uh, after like reaching like uh, around four, 400 uh, deaths. So during this phase, you let the virus flow completely freely, so C is equal to one, and then in phase two, you impose uh, some restrictive measures, and C is some function that may vary with time, and which in general is just less than one. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the picture. So one um, uh, remark that I would like to make is that, again, this kind of like framework is, is, is obviously not completely new, and, and actually, uh, if you, if you, if, as, uh, what, what was described in the first talk, if you, if you just ignore the non-linearity, uh, so, so if you work in, a, in an infinite population, right, so where like every potential infection becomes actually effective, right, you don't have to count the number of susceptible individuals in your population, and this is, as Tom said, like a really good description of the onset of the epidemics, then uh, what I just described is just uh, a plain crump Diegers branching process with no deaths, with no deaths, and in the terminology of Jaegers and Nerman, uh, a reproduction measure, which is given by uh, my point measure P, right? And so now what is the life cycle process? Again, in the same term, in the terminology of Jaegers and Nerman, X is just a random characteristic of, um, of, of the individual, right? And, and now if you want to think about, uh, if you want to, to, to think about uh, modeling lockdown, like using this suppression function, then what we do here using this function C is doing some, doing some printing of, um, of, of the infection tree, which is inhomogeneous in time. But, okay, so that's, that's it. Um, so before going into a, a, a detailed description of our, our result, let me maybe give you like, give you like a brief outline of, of, of what we find. So first of all, um, even if your um, uh, infection measure uh, can be quite complicated and reflect like a, a lot of underlying uh, heterogeneity, uh, and this is also not very surprising. I mean, this is something that comes up a lot in the literature. What will really matter like at the end is more like the intensity measure of the point measure. So the average infection measure that I call tau. And um, uh, this tau is directly related to the R0 because if you want to, to have uh, the, the average number of secondary infections, then what you need to do is to take tau pu, which is the number of, the average number of, 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 of of propagules that you sent uh, at, at, at time u, and so you integrate this quantity from zero to plus infinity. Okay, and so here's the main assumption that we make, and that's actually about it, plus some minor technical assumptions, is that R zero is less than infinity, which kind of boils down to assuming that there is no super spreader in your, in, in your population. Okay, so now here is the main result, um, like the meta result, I would say that if you look at the age structure of the population, and by the age structure, I mean that if you look at the number of individuals with an age which is in DA at time P, okay, then if you look at this age structure, which is a random quantity, then when you look at things in a very large population, then at the end of the day, you find a deterministic quantity, this NTA. And this NTA is just the solution of a mac henrik von Furster PD, okay? So this is, and I will go back to this PD a little bit. If you're not used to it, I can give you a bit more details about it. But you solve this PD. And the good thing about it is that once you have the age structure of the population, then you can recover everything. And this is what's written in blue here. So if you want to know what is the number of individual at time T in class J, so think about J as the number of hospitalized, number of individuals 
in uh, the intensive care units, then what you have to do is to take the one dimensional marginal of the life cycle process, and that's it, just one dimensional marginal, and ask what is the probability to be in I at HJ, and then average over the age profile. Okay, so, so the idea is that once you get the age profile of, of your population, then in order to recover like the full picture, you just need to average one dimensional margins. Okay, so this is actually quite simple because everything boils down to a simple one dimensional PD. So now a few words about the PD if you're not like uh, 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 very familiar with it. So you see that this PD is in R plus dot R plus. Okay, so time and age are positive. And so there are two boundary conditions. So there is one temporal boundary condition. So this is the initial age profile of your population, this G here. And there is a spatial boundary condition. So now what's kind of interesting and kind of, I don't know, puzzling the first time you see this PDE is that all the action is actually going on on the boundary. Only the boundary uh, condition conveys an interesting information. So if you look at the differential equation, what you get is a transport equation in, in age and time. And what this transport equation is telling you is just that your age of infection is just growing linearly with time. If my age is 10 tomorrow, it will be 11. That's about it, okay? So now the only interesting information about this PDE is what happens at the age boundary. So this NT of zero, okay? So NT of zero is the number of, um, of individuals at time T with age zero. So this is the number of newly infected individuals, okay? And so what this boundary condition is telling you it's telling you the following. So you want to think of B of T as the number of propagules that are sent in the environment, okay? And so how do you get the number of propagules? So first of all, you look at the contribution of an individual at age A, and this is tau of DA, right? Because tau of DA is the mean infection measure. And then you average out over the whole age profile. And if you want to take suppression into account, then you know that among all those propagules that will be sent in the environment, there is only a fraction C of T that we, that will be actually uh, out there, right? So, and then now you see that there is an S of T in front of the BT because in order for a potential infection to be an actual infection, uh, then you need to hit like a susceptible individual and the susceptible individual is one. So the total population size we normalized minus the number of infected and the number of infected is obtained by averaging over the, the whole H profile, okay? So, um, so again, the nice thing about this PD, uh, about the limiting model, is that it's much simpler than what you had at the microscopic level, since you started with something which could be extremely complicated with uh, an intricate uh, correlation between the different between the life cycle and um, the infection process. And at the end of the day, well, I mean, your like macroscopic model is only parameterized by uh, the one-dimensional mar marginal of the life cycle process and the average uh, infection rate, and that's it. Okay. So uh, maybe um, a bit more details um, about uh, our like convergence results. So, so first of all, uh, what we proved, we didn't prove much, I would say. I mean, uh, we, we kind of precast results that were out there, on, especially like proved uh, by, by Nerman, Nerman and Yegers. So, so if, you, if you take the branching approximation, so you just uh, forget um, about, uh, about the finite uh, size effect. So every potential infection is an actual infection. Then here is the first CRM. And uh, so what you do is that you don't start from a single infected individual. Uh, let's assume that you look at your epidemics uh, starting uh, at a time where you have like already a lot, of, a lot of infected individual. And so what you do, so you start with N infected in individuals. So here N is not the size of the population, right? It's just a number of infected. And then you start with a limiting age density, right? So you assume that all the individuals that are present at time zero have been infected according to some random variable which is chosen according to this density. And then you have a certain suppression function. So now what we prove is the following. So we take the empirical measure corresponding to ages and types in your population. So in other words, at time t, you just count all the individual and you, you, you just take into account their ages and their types. And then if you take this empirical measure, you rescale it by one over n, and what we can prove is a law of large number, right? So we converge to, um, um, to, to a deterministic, uh, to a deterministic uh, uh, measure. And uh, if you look at the age profile, N of TA, then what you get is um, a solution of a linear version of the McKendrick-Venterster equation. Namely, you get exactly the same transport equation, except that 
uh, on the boundary, right, the age boundary, then now you don't have this susceptible term in front of this integral, right? But this is exactly the same story. And obviously, I mean, this equation is, is much easier to solve than the previous one. So now there is kind of a natural question arising from, from this PD. So, so here I assume that at time t is equal to zero, I start from, um, uh, from a certain age profile, which is G, right? But I mean, how do you choose G? I mean, is it like something that you, that you enforce in an adequate way, or is it like a, a nice way of justifying uh, a choice called G? And, and what I would like to convince you in the next slide is that there is an answer, I mean, there is a natural candidate for the initial condition. And so this goes like this. So the idea here is to start with a single infected individual, right? Not N, just one single infected individual in a supercritical branching process. And then what I would like to do is to uh, describe uh, the empirical measure of ages and types, not starting from time zero, but starting after like a certain random time, right? So think of about TK as being like the time at which you reach a certain number of deaths, a certain number of hospitalized. So you want to think of TK as the beginning of lockdown, where like at least in France or in many countries, we already had like a lot of, of, of infected individuals in the population, right? And so again, what we would like to do is to, is to look at this empirical measure, right? And shift it after time t, uh, after time t of k. So we take this empirical measure, we shift it at time t of k, then we, in order to get a non-degenerate limit, we renormalize by the number of infected at time t, by infected I mean the total number of individuals who have been infected before time t. And what we find is exactly the same limit as before, okay? So we find a solution to the mechanic and faster equation. But now, the age profile is not something that you choose in an ad hoc way. It's just the exponential profile where alpha is the Malthusian parameter of the epidemics, okay? So that's, so that's one way of, 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 of so in, in the, when we do inference to, 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 to uh, to, uh, to, to, to infer, like, let's say, like the value of the R0 during the lockdown period. So this is one way of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of picking like the initial condition of your PD. So um, a third theorem, so for the moment, uh, things uh, were kind of, uh, I mean, not easy, but at least I think like a lot of people uh, worked in that direction in the past and we, we just used uh, previous approaches. So now what happens if you want to take finite population effect, right? So, so, so what I would like to do now is to take the nonlinear model. So we have uh, 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 populations of size n, and uh, exactly as in the first theorem, so I don't start with a single infected individual, I start with um, a large fraction of infected, in, uh, with, well, a, a positive fraction of infected individual in my population, x. And then again, I start from a certain ad hoc, like age uh, density function. And so what we prove is that um, if we renormalize the gain, uh, the, the empirical measure by the total population size, then there is convergence to exactly the same type of limit, except that now the H profile is not given by the solution of the linear Mackey-Drink uh, PD, but the non-linear version of it, okay? And so again, you can ask exactly the same question as before, and I think uh, it's, 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 it's not as obvious as, as, as it used to be like in the, branching, in the branching world. What is the kind of like natural initial conditions that you should choose? Um, one lazy way of doing it is to assuming that at the beginning of lockdown, the fraction of infected individual is positive but small, in which case you can assume that this like age profile that you choose at the beginning is the result of an exponential phase where like it was not too bad not to take saturation into account. And, and so kind of like a natural choice for G is to take the exponential profiles that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so let me kind of like go a little bit further, right? So, so now I would like to take spatial uh, constraint into an account. So I would like to show you that this McKendrick PD actually emerges even if you remove these very restrictive uh, mean field assumptions that, uh, that we have for the moment, right? So at the, for the moment, we, we, every time I send a propagule in the environment, it picks like one individual uniformly at random. So of course we know, and this is especially uh, true during the lockdown period, that uh, population are actually structured in a very like rigid way. Uh, so they are like naturally organized into a, a hierarchical structure. You have households which are groups into buildings, buildings into neighborhoods, neighborhoods into cities, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and again, I mean, this is, I mean, typically true during confinement. And, and so I think there is, uh, um, I mean, well, I mean, it's kind of, 
it's not completely reasonable to, to make, I mean, this mean field assumption is, uh, is actually quite restrictive, right? So, so what I would like to do here is to, to have kind of a, a toy model uh, uh, to kind of deal with the situation. So I would like to start with something quite simple. So I only have two levels, right? So we have subunits, think of buildings, which are grouped into a larger structure, let's say a neighborhood, right? So I have KN subunits, and in each of the units, I have N individuals, right? So I partition my population into small subunits, okay? So that's, uh, I guess, kind of reasonable. Uh, if you think about um, lockdown or like partial lockdown, where like uh, populations are not, so for instance, in France, people were not allowed to move like 100 kilometers away from, uh, from, from the household. So, 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 well, so, so KN represents the scale at which you impose the lockdown, I guess. And so what I would like to do now is to take exactly the same model as before, right? Except that now, when I send a propagule, when I'm infectious and I send a propagule in the environment, then I hit someone in the local community with probability one minus M, and otherwise my propagule will migrate and pick like one other community uniformly at random, right? So this is, this is, this is a standard like metapopulation model, okay? And so my assumption is that, well, uh, R zero could be greater than one, meaning that the infection could, I mean, could, could spread at the local level, but I have enough restriction at uh, the global, well, so, so the infection could spread at the local level, but the migration probability is very small. So it's of the order C divided by F, okay? And so the reason I choose this scaling is because, well, there is a very nice scaling relation when you choose this migration probability, as you will see in a second, okay? So again, same feature as, uh, as above, except that now I have communities and I have very limited migration between those communities. So this is a very strong like lockdown strategy. And so what we find is the following. So here are some simulations. So what you see on the right uh, are some, uh, so I fix all the parameters, but I vary as a value of n. So the different curves corresponds to different values of n. And so what you see is that, um, uh, well, so, so okay, so, so, this is, so this is what you see on the right-hand side. And so what, you sh what we show on the, on the right-hand side is that there is a very nice scaling relation in the sense that if you take the right picture, you accelerate time by log n, okay? And you rescale the number of infected by log n, then all the curve will match, okay? So everything is completely the same. So, so what you observe here is, I mean, I don't know. I don't, so, so this is, uh, at some point, they were talking about it a lot, like in the news, but this is like flattening the curve, if you want, right? So, so what you see is that the total number of infected remains constant because you accelerate uh, time, but uh, you, uh, you also uh, rescale the number of, of infected by log n, so the area below the curve remains constant, but time is slowed down by logarithm of n. So what those simulations show you is that um, if you impose a very strong lockdown, it doesn't necessarily reduce the number of infected, of, of infected individuals uh, at the end of the day, the total number of individuals that will be infected at the end of the infection, but it reduces the time of the epidemics by log n. And of course, like if you if you're worried about like maximal occupancy in hospitals and so on the like, then this is well, I mean this is actually quite important. Okay, and so how do you how do you prove uh, how how do you make it a theorem? So here it is, right? So so what we can prove is that again. Um, what you see on the simulation is related to the Mac and Riggin faster equation, okay? And um, I don't want to go too much into the details, but uh, what we prove is that because you have very limited uh, 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 migration between the different clusters, okay? Then there is a separation of time scale. And what this Mac and Riggin faster equation does for you is that it describes the dynamics, not at the individual level, but at the population level, at the community level. So, so here, A doesn't correspond to the age of infection of an individual, but it corresponds to the age of infection of a community, okay? And um, so that's, but again, even if it's a very different model, you can, I mean, you, you, can, you, can, you can model it at the limit by a McKendrick von Terster equation. So um, as a summary of what I did so far, um, so, uh, 
what uh, we propose uh, is um, a way of modeling um, uh, very general epidemics, uh, which is, uh, we think, quite elegant at the end because uh, everything boils down to a one-dimensional PD describing the age structure of a population. And then once you have this age structure, then you're good to go. Uh, and also, so there is the question of the initial condition, which is actually a, a very interesting one. I don't have time to, to talk about it now. Uh, you can take the exponential distribution. It turns out that data says that you should choose otherwise, uh, that you haven't reached the stationarity uh, at the beginning of lockdown. And this raises a lot of questions about the predictability of a lockdown strategy. Uh, I could tell you a little bit more about it later if you're interested. Uh, but yes, so that's, um, that's, that's what we did. Uh, and so, so now I would like to make some connection with the existing literature. So I think uh, what we all observed like in the past few months is that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing and very puzzling at the same time. Uh, so, so at least I think one month or two months ago, there were more like 60,000 publications on the COVID-19 epidemics. And a lot of them were like on modeling, right? And well, I mean, the issue uh, I have and that many of, uh, is that, well, in one paper, you see like one model and in another paper, you see another one and it can get like really complicated, right? So, so for instance, uh, uh, I took this paper, which is uh, probably a very good paper, uh, very highly cited, but, but so, so, so the way uh, people tend to model things more often than not is to directly model uh, the compartments, okay? So you give yourself a very complicated uh, life cycle, and this is what you see in this picture. Then you specify what are the rates to go to, from one compartment to another, okay? And this is usually Markovian. You have to do a lot of underlying assumptions. And then once you have uh, those transition rates between the different compartments, then uh, you write down like the system of ODE associated to it. And this time, the system of ODE, if you have like a lot of compartments, a lot of age classes can, well, I mean, this can go completely out of control, right? So, so you can end up with an ODE of dimension 10 with a lot of non-linearities and the, the like. And so, so, so this is problematic from a, a, a mathematical point of view and also from a numerical point of view, I think. And I think what we show here is that there is a way of modeling things where well, um, everything boiled down to a simple one-dimensional PD. And, uh, and, and well, you, you don't, get, but of course you have to make a little detour, right? You have to kind of model something that a priori you don't really care about, which is the age structure of the population. But this kind of hidden variable is kind of like contain all the information somehow, right? So, so that's, uh, so, so just a few words about uh, inference. So I think what's really good about uh, what we propose here as well is that we are not the only one actually to, to, to model things that way, but the point we would like to make is that this is the right way to do, it, to, to, to do it probably, right? So, so um, um, also, uh, so a few words about uh, inference. Again, I think this is a, a, a very nice from an inference point of view because once you have your PDE, then you can add up as much complexity as you want. So let me illustrate this with uh, some uh, uh, some simulations that we did. So here are some uh, 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 incidence curves uh, taken from the French data. So you have the number of uh, daily hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and number of deceased. Okay. And so now what we would like to do is to take our model, so this McHenry von Foster PD, and add like a life cycle on top of it. So we decorate the PD with a life cycle, right? So, so the methodology is really like take McHenry von Foster and decorate it with a life cycle. So the simplest life cycle that you can imagine is the following. Uh, once you arrive at the hospital, either you get hospitalized and well, you don't go to the ICU, you recover, you go home, you're happy, or well, uh, you get hospitalized, but uh, well, things can get sour, right? Uh, you go to uh, the ICU and then after that, you either dead or like deceased, right? So, so this is like uh, the most like parsimonious model you can think of. And actually we can use this kind of very simple life cycle to, to, to feed the data. So now what, what if you take the calibrated values and you try to fit uh, more complex, you, you try to see whether you fit like more complex data. Let's say like the, admi uh, the, uh, the occupancy data. How many individuals do you have in ICU today? How many people are located at the hospital and so on and so forth. And you see that even if you match the admission, right, perfectly almost, then you're completely off the occupied data, okay? So what this means is that probably 
the life cycle, cycle that you use to decorate your PD is not rich enough, right? You have to add more heterogeneity and more structure. And so what, uh, what we do is that we, so what, uh, and this is actually something which is observed uh, in, uh, uh, in, in clinical data. So here you see that my life cycle is such that if, if I die, I have to go through the ICU units. But it, actually it's not the case. In general, you have actually a large fraction of the population, at least in France, that, that die before going to ICU. Right, and after a few days, actually. So I think that during the crisis, at some point, there were like so much uh, saturation in the hospitals that actually, like, some patients patients were kind of left aside and, and died after a few days. Right. So so the way we represent this is in the following. So if you go to you to the IC, uh, if you so sorry, if you go to the hospitals, so either you deceased after a few days without going through the ICU, or you go to an in intensive care unit and then you die. And we also assume that when you go to the hospital, you have uh, long recovery or we, have, or we have short recovery, right? So we had more heterogeneity into, into, the, life, into the life cycle. And then now we can uh, infer uh, the parameter of the model in such a way that you match the occupancy data, but also the admission data. Okay, so, so, so the methodology is that starting from your PD, you can complexify the life cycle as much as you want in order to fit uh, more and more complex data. And I think this is a really challenge, uh, a real challenge of the current epidemics because I mean, this is the first time uh, in history that we have so much data. So, so I think, well, uh, it's, it's quite important to kind of like take care, I mean, kind of take into account everything. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, so what we propose is a flexible and uh, we believe simple framework, uh, which has many advantages. First of all, it emerges as a universal scanning limit of a very large class of epidemic model. It can fit complex data and we can use it to now casting and predicting uh, different values of R0. Um, so the good thing about this model is that uh, space can be taken into account. I showed you one example with uh, a population with a certain hierarchical structure. Actually, and this is something that we started discussing with, uh, with Andreas recently. You can actually, so in those random characteristic in this life cycle, you can add a geographic location and take space into account. Uh, and so you can build up an infectious uh, model on R2. So this can be uh, uh, implemented using our methodology. There are like other natural uh, extensions. So uh, I think one of the main restrictions of what I showed you is that um, uh, for the moment, uh, everything is completely, I mean, uniform in the sense that you, you send probably uniformly at random in the population. Uh, well, it's not, not to be the case. In general, if you have some age classes, you're much more likely to infect someone in, in your own age classes. But so this can be taken into account. So this will be exactly the same framework, but now you just have to increase uh, the, uh, the dimensionality of your McKendrick uh, von Foster equation, but this is the same thing, right? Exactly the same thing. Uh, something uh, which is quite important and which, has, which was uh, actually uh, addressed by Tim Britton uh, in the first part of today's talk is the inhomogeneity and the susceptibility. So how do you take this into account in the model that I just showed you? And uh, this is something that uh, I quickly addressed during my talk. Uh, there is a question of predictability. Uh, so from a practical point of view, in case of a second wave, so if you, for example, uh, reinitiate lockdown after observing a certain number of deaths or hospitalized, can you, um, can you make prediction on the number of deaths or the number of hospitalized or maximal occupancy at the hospital uh, during this lockdown period? And from a mathematical point of view, uh, this kind of boils down to the uncertainty that you have in the initial condition of the McKendrick von Foster equation. Uh, so again, what I told you is that kind of a natural choice is the exponential distribution, but data suggests actually quite otherwise that there is a lot of randomness in the initial condition. And, um, and this leaves like a lot of uh, very interesting open questions. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, you for your attention and uh, the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, both, um, uh, both, both Emmanuel and Amori. Uh, I have a uh, couple of uh, two questions which were already posed during Amori's uh, uh, lectures, uh, part of the lecture, uh, from uh, Enrico Scalas and uh, uh, Gian Scaliato. Are they present? 
Uh, yes, here is Enrico Scalas. Can you hear me? Y yes. Yes, okay. So um, actually we had a private discussion, but essentially my question was a practical one. So if uh, the uh, suppression model that was um, presented by Amori uh, can be uh, extended uh, or used uh, for mm, a traditional uh, tracing and isolation uh, done by hand by public health authorities. Yes, so my, uh, my answer was that um, actually as a first approximation you can uh, say that y then the fraction of uh, app users will then be the probability that uh, you can be efficiently traced um, but the the difference is that when you're an app user you remain an app user even after uh, having uh, having been traced uh, rather uh, and the difference with the uh, uh, the likelihood of effectively being traced uh, can, can change like independently at each run, each time you're, you're in contact with a symptomatic individual. Okay, so uh, the idea is that uh, I think um, because as you, um, as you trace more individuals, uh, more, more app users, uh, you, you get less app users in your, in your uh, population of infected. And that not, that's not the same for people who are easy, easy to trace, for example. And so I think that my conclusions uh, in the case of uh, a contact tracing app are a little bit more pessimistic than uh, manual contact tracing. Mm -hmm. So, any yes. further questions or yes, comments? The, the, the second question was about how big the contact tree is compared to the infection tree for practical reasons because these people have in some sense to be contacted or something like that and Amory has already answered uh, privately but maybe pardon maybe he wants to add something yes so, so the question is about uh, thank you very much for your question so the question is about uh, like you're jointly considering the uh, uh, whole contact network uh, and the transmission tree which is a sub network of the contact network, okay? And so um, my work was only con uh, considering the transmission tree, but if you want to have a bigger picture of uh, looking at the whole contact network, then you see that uh, contacts, uh, con physical contacts uh, that are uh, alerted by the app uh, are much more numerous than just people that you have infected or, or, or that have infected you. And so that can come at a huge cost for, for, for the economy and for the psychology of these people. And I know that um, uh, some people, mainly statistical physicists, uh, use data on, for example, you know, uh, uh, physical contacts inside uh, schools or uh, inside neighborhoods, so kind of uh, life size experiments that have uh, been done. Um, trying to estimate the, the, the shape of physical contacts. Um, are trying to, to, to do this uh, joint modeling of both the contact network and the transmission tree inside the contact network. And so, yeah, that depends. I think that depends heavily on, uh, on uh, which, which contact network you're looking at, whether it's in the uh, uh, collective transports or in, in schools or uh, at work, etc. So, any further comments or questions? Uh, I had one a short comment myself to the last part of of Emmanuel's presentation. Uh, the uh, uh, von First or the Kendrick von Furster equation uh, re, uh, obviously arises quite generally in 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 general branching processes when they turn large. They can be approximated that way, and there is a bunch of papers by by um, uh, Fima Kliban, uh, JN, and myself, and Kais Hamsa, which might be of interest for you, mm -hmm. even, even, even though they are not at all related to, directly related to, to epidemic spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, again, I mean, I think uh, there are like many results which are already contained in your work. It was just more like, 
uh, <laughs> like, uh, like to remind people of, uh, of, uh, of this sort of result, which I think are like very interesting in this context. Um, yes, yeah. yes, it's, 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 it's it, indeed, indeed. So, well, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, I okay. guess this is the end of it, and we should also thank the organizers, of course, for this excellent choice of speakers. Well, just before I um, unmute everyone <clears throat> to clap, I'd just like to say, it's, for me, it's a personal pleasure to see branching processes, and in particular, uh, Krumbode Jaegers branching processes, which uh, we're very lucky to have the Jaegers of Krumbode Jaegers with us today. Um, but it's really a pleasure to see them being used so effectively um, in these models. It's such a thrill for me after, after so many years. And I, and I hope, uh, I'm sure Peter actually agrees the same in this sense. Sure. <laughs> okay, after three, I'm going to unmute you all and you can, and you can clap all the speakers. So one, two, three. Okay, guys, so what happens next is um, if you uh, want to go, that's fine. Uh, you're not obliged to stay, but otherwise I'm going to create um, two breakout rooms. And uh, in these breakout rooms,